Well, what I'd love to talk about, I mean, um, the future of cities. How do you see the forces that will shape the city of the future? But if architecture is about improving the quality of life, then surely this is right at the heart of, of architecture. But how do we effect that revolution, that transformation? Could I kind of launch straight in? You've written extensively on architecture, cities, you've published books, uh, you're past dean of, of Parsons, so you continue that role as educator. So um, it would be great to exchange some views about cities. I mean, sure. to start, cities of the future, I mean, how do you see the city in the future? Uh, how does that relate perhaps to trends that we can see today that will blossom into, into a new reality? Well, nothing, nothing like starting with a narrow question, <laughs> is there? <laughs> is he? Okay. Um, you know, there are so many trends now and COVID has altered the scope somewhat, although I'm not a believer in the theory that uh, COVID enormous and, and significant as its impact is, is going to completely change the direction of cities. Um, I mean, I think we, we, we have be, been an urbanizing world for a long time and we're going to continue to be that. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, since you've asked about large trends, um, I, I think the, the key question right now is whether certain mega trends, uh, sustainability, the need for uh, responsible energy policy, um, probably leading among them, um, will how they will be able to dovetail with a greater and greater desire for conventional traditional uh pleasing urban experience uh the accident and the serendipity of a great city uh you know i'm now working on a book that is several years away so i don't want to um say too much because I'm only at an early stage, but I've always been fascinated by the dynamic between planning and happenstance. And, I, you know, I'm, I've always felt that many of the things that are most treasured by all of us in cities are not things that were planned. They're things that happen by accident, by happy accident, obviously. Um, the general eclecticism of much of London is one example. The, the pleasures of walking along a street um, are absolutely vital to our sense of what the urban experience is. Yet we know um, in no time period, but particularly not today, is the can we allow happenstance laissez-faire say to run its course to to carry the day uh, i mean the laissez-faire city is an unlivable city and yet you cannot plan down to the last inch um i think places that are planned down to the last inch lack a certain vital quality of life that is meaningful to all of us precisely how these things play off against each other, how they balance each other, um, is something that fascinates me, and I'm just beginning to try to get a handle on it. So I think this particular book is, is a few years away, but uh, it's been particularly in my mind since COVID, of course, because um, if there's one thing that the pandemic, at least for a while, put into question, it was the viability of the traditional dense city in which face-to-face -face encounters were the lifeblood uh, and indeed in which happenstance was often 
critically important as well. And of course, suddenly we could not afford to do that. And suddenly the all those things that were so cherished became dangerous or perceived as dangerous, let's say. Um, now we're a little bit more aware and we also thankfully, thankfully due to science, we, we're, we're moving rapidly beyond this. Uh, but um, what has emerged from it has been, you know, a degree of anxiety about the city that we have not seen for a number of years. You know, I began my career in the 1970s at a time when uh, you had to be a real serious urbanist or architect to really love cities. <laughs> and uh, when I settled in New York in the 70s, most of the people I'd gone to school with thought I was absolutely crazy. Why would you possibly do that? Um, there are elements of the history never repeats itself precisely, but as as wiser people than I have said, it doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. And we are seeing certain things today that have some parallels to the 70s. Um, and uh, I'm now drifting somewhat from your original question, but uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping that the breadth of that opening question was an invitation just to sort of uh, Absolutely. A series of free associations, which is, I think is what I'm doing here. Absolutely. But, good, good. Okay. Um, but anyway, uh, I was, let, let me, let me, let me uh, speak for just a moment about the 70s, because that too is something that's been very vivid in my mind when today um, the city was, New York in particular, but most cities were. Um, Certainly less safe. The public realm was badly cared for, if cared for at all. Um, they were perceived as very difficult, harsh, dirty, often dangerous places. Um, and yet, they were also cheap. And the price of entry was very low. Artists could afford to be in New York. Dancers could afford to be in New York. Writers could afford to be in New York. I started my career as a journalist at the New York Times. And I will say that while I did not earn a great deal of money in those first years, um, I did not earn one ten thousandth of what a banker earns, which is probably what a journalist today earns. I mean, the, the, the things were somewhat more aligned. Um, and there was an, a kind of raw energy under the surface. The fact that the city was open to all meant it, it was affordable and welcoming to people who took risks, artistic risks, as well as investment risks. Um, you know, we live in a very different world today, a world that is so dominated by the financial services industry um, that has, to be fair, benefited many of us in many, many ways, but has also raised the price of entry into great cities far beyond what it was in the years when I started my career. Um, so that's one reason I am not as totally distressed by some of the uh, difficulties cities are going through right now in that, um, you know, since thankfully I am, I guess I could say thankfully, I'm not a real estate developer who has hundreds of millions of dollars tied up in empty office buildings. And so, um, you know, I can greet the decline in value with a certain cautious optimism, I hope not naive, um, but uh, it, I would like to think that the cities could be somewhat more welcoming to those who have been priced out of them in the last generation. Um, now, that's getting away from trends, which is how you began, the question with which you began this. Um, but in fact, um, it isn't fully because, of course, you know, cities, cities follow economies as well as create them. 
and we we've certainly seen that in in the last generation um but it's also a way of saying that you know we do not entirely know how post pandemic life and the city will sort of shake out i i'm i'm optimistic but not uh not certain about anything right now <clears throat> I mean, I, I'd love to come back to trends and suggest that perhaps the whole issue of equality is one of several trends. Um, yes, I think that's a very good way, actually. To, that 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 is the neatest, deftest, and um, <laughs> most convincing way to tie together your very focused opening question and my rather rambling response. No, no, I <laughs> but thank no. you. Enormously helpful because it takes us, before I come back to trends, it takes us on one thought that your, um, uh, as it were, um, reflecting on spontaneity, uh, planning versus the organic, the, yes, yes, you know, yes. Patterns, as you put it. But would you not perhaps agree that, that there is no such thing as the unplanned city, just to be provocative. In other words, the spontaneity in New York is within a grid. The mm -hmm. hat chance in London is in the opposite, the polar opposite of a grid, but it is still a very defined structure because as those individual villages with their high streets merge and morph together into a larger entity. Um, they still retain that neighborhood quality, but the high street is a conscious act of planning, even if it winds. I mean, it might have followed a riverbed or it might have, you know, um, in in ages past have, uh, have consolidated something that was a desire line and and that was a conscious act uh, so i i agree with you totally that the vitality of a city is about its spontaneity but in i think in in any case that i can think of it is within something that in a in a larger sense has has created a framework i i agree completely with you norman and yet at the same time i think there is a difference between the overt and large scale act of what we might call mega planning that the creation of the new york grid represented and a desire line which is of course uh itself i think one of the most wonderful and underused and underappreciated phrases in the english language desire line there's something almost poetic about it and it also of course reflects the the naturalness of certain routes certain roads i know that landscape architects like to call the the paths worn by um pedestrians in parks across grass, desire lines, and often contrast them with the paved paths that people skip over, perhaps to create a shortcut between two paved paths. And that is also called a desire line. So um, there is a, a sort of casualness to that, that I would tend to classify more within the category of spontaneity and within the category of planning. Um, I think of planning as often more divorced from, from the day-to-day -day casualness of spontaneous life. Um, but of course, you, you're also helping me realize another important point, which is that spontaneity and planning are not, in fact, two entirely opposite things that never meet. They're really the two extremes of a continuum, and most things that happen in cities exist somewhere in between, and in which, in fact, each influences the other. The very way in which desire lines, in fact, come to be, the very, very way in which the 
small villages that made up London and the high streets, which indeed may well have had casual, almost accidental form that then in turn takes on the uh, the presence, the rigidity, the stature, we might say, of, of planned things and influences other things, so forth. Um, I'm... Um, I mean, I'm just fascinated by that whole process and by the the way in which it sort of resists clear metrics and clear understanding, um, which for me only makes it more interesting actually and more more enticing to to try to study. Yes, I mean, yeah. on, I mean, coming back to to trends, I, you know, I I just noted trends in terms of mobility, public space the workplace, equality. Of course, they're all connected. You move one and it affects uh, of course. the other. And I think what is fascinating is the way in which we've seen the, the growth of the public domain of pedestrian space at the expense of vehicles. And yet, as a consequence of the, the pandemic, um, which suggested to me that the pandemic was not creating change, but was rather exaggerating and magnifying trends that were already apparent. I mean, could you? Ab I, I uh, absolutely, I totally right. I mean, the the pandemic in many ways has accelerated certain changes that were already in process. The gradual or let's say the push to um, remove the hegemony that the automobile has had over the city street uh, goes back long well before the pandemic um, but gave it an enormous boost and and push forward um, and I think uh, I'm particularly interested in seeing how much of that we can retain in the coming years as the pandemic recedes. Um, but you're, you're absolutely and totally right. You know, the, the, the automobile, which you and I share a love of as an aesthetic object and as a piece of technological history, nevertheless, um, is not the wisest or most practical uh, default means of transportation, particularly in a city. And um, so we, 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 you and I love automobiles in spite of that fact, not because of it, <laughs> <laughs> but we, I think we both fully recognize the, the shortcomings of the automobile in terms of its relationship to a dense city. And um, I've welcomed for a long time the slow, halting, gradual, and often um, bitterly fought over transition of cities toward, rather of streets, excuse me, toward uh, giving more public space to non-automobile uses. Um, and there's no question that, that uh, the pandemic pushed that forward enormously. Uh, New York, even though it's emerging rapidly from pandemic mode, we might say, uh, is still, you know, the, the streets are still lined with these various shed, dining sheds, we might call them, that uh, are itself, by the way, I hope before they're gone, well, first, I hope they don't entirely disappear, but second, <laughs> I hope before they do disappear, somebody documents them because, in fact, uh, you know, they're, there's, they're, they range from, you know, the, the, the elegance of Danielle's pavilion on 65th Street to things that are truly just slapped together sheds of plywood <laughs> on other streets. And uh, they also have very varying degrees of enclosure and, and so forth. Uh, but they have represent a remarkable transformation and a claiming of both the sidewalk and the street itself um, in a way that uh, at its best is actually thrilling in some areas. And uh, I hope we hold on to much of that progress. Um, we'll see. Um, 
I, I think your observation on that leads to I mean, one, uh, one thing that perhaps has changed, it may be temporary, is, is public attitude. And in a way, it's manifest in that wonderful eruption of those temporary and hopefully not so temporary. But um, that whole thing about public attitude, I mean, brings me back historically to Jane Jacobs, uh, mm -hmm. an activist, and, and raises, I think, questions uh, about the planned, the informal, the spontaneous, and really decision making, the extent to which it can be bottom up as opposed to, to top down. How do you see that as a process uh, emerging in the future? Well, that's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, I would begin by saying that while, I mean, I think no writer has had a greater influence on our attitude toward the city than Jane Jacobs. Um, I mean, she truly is the formative figure. Um, and indeed, I would almost say, uh, let me digress for a second to say that I, 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 th I think she deserves to be seen not just in the pantheon of those who have written about cities, but I like to group her with two other women, each of whom published extraordinary books in the very early 1960s, each of whom was very much an outsider in her field each of whom was disdained by the experts within that field and each of whom managed to have a transformative effect on history. I mean, the other two are Rachel Carson and the Silent Spring, which really helped launch the environmental movement, and Betty Friedan and the Feminine Mystique and the Feminist Movement. Um, those were all published within a couple of years of each other by three women, each of whom were complete outsiders each of whom was rejected by the orthodoxy of that field. And all three books have been transformative on modern society and culture. Um, anyway, back to Jane Jacobs in particular. Um, but much of her argument, the thing that is also fascinating about Jane Jacobs is while she has affected the thinking of all of us, myself no less than anybody uh and continues to what her basic message was in the death and life of great american cities um is in fact not particularly valid today um in spite of how much he's influenced us and I, by that i mean that her argument was that Indeed, and this goes back to my earlier comment about spontaneity and natural organic growth versus planning uh, and intention. Um, her argument was that the West Village, Greenwich Village in New York, where she lived, was such a wonderful neighborhood. The every and the planners could only screw it up by intervening, and the best thing to do was leave it alone because this nat this mix of wonderful people and different kinds of people and different kinds of places and wonderful street life, which she memorably called the street ballet, um, we can only screw it up, leave it alone. Planners don't know as much as they think they know and they generally deaden places when they intrude upon them. Okay. Uh, she was absolutely right in terms of the growth of the Greenwich Village in the 1950s when she was doing her research. Um, today, of course, um, Greenwich Village is a far less diverse place. It is so expensive that Jane Jacobs and her husband, who was a young architect when they bought their townhouse on Hudson Street, could not, not dream of buying an entire townhouse. Um, and the only things that have preserved um, what degree of mixed of diversity and and e even equality um, it that neighborhood still has has really been the very intervention that she discouraged. 
we intervene in different ways for different reasons today. That's what I mean. And if we let things naturally occur, the village would no longer be the place that Jane Jacobs held up as a model for, for the world, really, as a model of an urban neighborhood for the world. Uh, and I think similar things exist in London. Uh, while the the heritage movement, the preservation movement, has had its share of excesses and foolishnesses in both London and New York, it's also true that the assertive intervention that it represents is the one thing that has kind of held things back from changing so radically that that both London and New York look like Pudong and Shanghai or something like that. <laughs> and so um, so we're, th there's a paradox here that um, and indeed the citizen engagement that Jane Jacobs so inspired in so many people has become the force of intervention as opposed to the, quote, expertise, close quote, of planners, um, which it holds in check and serves as a countervailing force to. Um, so uh, to, to return perhaps more, more closely to the actual question that you put on the table, which is, it was kind of a, in a way it's about sort of power and planning and, and top down versus bottom up. Um, we in the era of Jane Jacobs, there's now an enormous amount of bottom up planning. Um, it has often, however, served as a force, as a reactionary force, as a force of um, obstruction and conservatism. Uh, there's another paradox in all of this, of course, because uh, it's usually associated with the left, not with the right. Uh, and yet it's the left that is often the most conservative and reactionary force in terms of building and redevelopment of cities. Um, and the the left that often wants to freeze cities as they are, as opposed to allowing them to continue to grow and change and develop. Um, we ultimately need a balance, as in all things, we need a balance. And as a species, we're never very good at finding balance. We tend to, you know, uh, vacillate between extremes. And so um, I think in many ways there's been too much. There had been no planning from the bottom up pre-Jane Jacobs. Robert Moses in New York, you know, decreed as a czar what would happen. And it generally did, with very few exceptions. Um, now, in fact, we're in an almost an opposite position where it's very, very difficult to make large scale, bold infrastructure decisions, many of which we still have to make. And we can't we can't do all our planning from the bottom up or or nothing will ever happen. I mean, you know, I am very, very struck by uh, something that was said to me by one of your colleagues a dozen years ago or more when he was taking me on a tour of the new terminal that you had just completed in Beijing and said that the entire process of that project from conception to design to construction to opening took significantly less time than the environmental public hearing process over Terminal 5 at Heathrow. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone design and construction. So, you know, I mean, that has stayed for, for a dozen years as a, a sort of reminder in my mind about the fact that, you know, if everything is from the bottom up, we can't do the things we need to do. And yet, of course, if everything is from the top down, um, we don't always build wisely. We often build cruelly. We often build without judgment and without nuance. So how do we balance these things? It, it's, sort of, you know, it, it, the older I get, the longer I've been looking at cities, the more I think balance is the thing that we need most of. But balance is not a sexy word, you know? It, it, it's sort of a, uh, it's, it's sexier and seems more, 
exciting and say, let's build boldly and do everything, or let's preserve and stop and protect the city from the horrible people wanting to destroy it. Those extreme positions, you know, are so much more, they make, you know, they get the blood running in a certain way. Um, balance is a much cooler idea and much harder to sell, <laughs> I think. But it's what we really need, I think. I think it's a great note to end on, Paul. <laughs> it's uh, conclusive and optimistic. So, well, I hope so. Um, I, I want to be optimistic because by nature, I think I, like you, am an optimist. And, uh, you know, but we have a lot of forces at play here and uh, they're very, very different. And uh, I, you know, at, at one thing we haven't talked about, particularly, which I think we maybe alluded to a few minutes ago, was the... In, while there is a greater commitment to the public realm today than there was, at the same time, more of the so-called public realm is actually private. And is that good? Is that not good? What are the risks entailed in that privatization of well, the public? I mean, Paul, what, what I was going to end on was uh, something that you've already touched on in some depth, and that is yeah. the relationship between the public and private, between centralization and decentralization and between local and global yes, calling yes, right, yes. globalization so there's a linkage between those and i think um i think one of if 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 i could somehow typify today it's you know, globalization has been a tremendous force for good in terms of lifting millions, you know, yes, maybe yes. billions out of poverty. It's also created rust belts in, uh, yeah. and, you know, social mayhem in, in, a, in more established societies. Absolutely. Just, just as, you know, the Industrial Revolution uh, 200 years ago uh, created both great, great benefit and immense, immense problems and challenges. Uh, you know, there's the end of the day, uh, as another wise person said, there is no free lunch. <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> we pay for everything one way or another. And, you know, there is more power in the private sector today than I think there perhaps has ever been or certainly has been for a hundred years. Um, much of it is to great social benefit, sometimes because the private sector has actually listened and learned and indeed encouraged the creation of, of more engaging public space. Um, but some of it also has been full of fraught with risks and challenges and difficulty. And so, uh, but yes. It will be very exciting to see the next. These are reasons all of us want to keep engaged and and see what happens. You know, and and indeed, in your case, play a role in making it happen. Well, Paul, it's been great. Really enjoyed.